Hello everyone, Karen Glasser here and welcome to Uncorked, life exposed in the most unexpected ways where what you see is not always what you get. I'm joined by my amazing co-host Mel Greenberg for an enlightening conversation about the real Ireland with Rachel Gaffney. So Mel, how are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm so happy to be back and here on Uncorked and today we're, I, Rachel and my Long time friend. We met through our boys actually playing football for a company that produces these games all over the world. And that was many, many years ago. And then we actually, that was not in person. Then we met in person in Dallas and we've stayed connected all these years. And it's really fun to have you on today, Rachel, because on our show Uncorked, you were born in Cork. And we're going to, you know, one thing. Rachel is Irish, and I think the world in general, especially today, we have so many preconceived notions about nationalities, religions, this, that, and the other thing. And and there is that, you say Ireland, you you maybe go to beer, you maybe go to this or that, and there is so much more to this incredible, beautiful, rich, vibrant country. And Rachel is all about that, getting that out there. So we are happy to uncork the real Ireland with Rachel Gaffney. And I'm so excited about that. Before we bring her in, let's make sure that we do some housekeeping. So whether you are watching this in the present right now or you're watching it on the replay years from now, whenever it is, make sure you put hi in the comments and tell us where you are watching from. And without further ado, let's welcome Rachel to the show. So are you? Hi, welcome Rachel and welcome to all of you out there watching, this is Rachel Gaffney. Hi. Rachel, we're so excited that you're here. We've been talking about this for several weeks um, and we've got a lot of really cool things to talk about. We have some beautiful images that you sent to us and we're gonna be talking about a lot of different things. So let's let's just jump in. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously Mel said you're, you're Irish, you're from Ireland. What was the impetus of you just jumping into all of this, other than the fact that you're Irish, why did you decide to just make your entire business around Ireland? Okay, that's the one question that I can always answer very quickly. <laughs> so I moved to the United States in 1996, uh, moved to Dallas to be precise from London with my husband, uh, ha had my first baby uh, in London, brought him over with me, he was three months old. Uh, after two or three years here, uh, we were transferred maybe four years to Chicago. I now had two boys. We were in Chicago for two years and moved back to Dallas in 2001. Between 96 and 2001, during those times, I was staying at home, looking after the boys. I was the corporate wife, mother, you know, at the playground, the playgroups. And it had nothing to do with socioeconomic or any kind of de demographic other than that I noticed that people's perception of the Ireland I grew up in, the Ireland I know, the Ireland that my family live in and my friends still live in, was so far removed from, it was a, there was a huge disconnect, girls. I mean, what they thought was going on, how we ate, how we lived, some might think it's funny, but it really wasn't funny. And I thought, I need to change that narrative. I want to change the story. So I leave the negative space to other people. We all know that even in this day and age, there are plenty of people out there telling you what you're doing wrong, how you look terrible, how you, you know, but there are so many people filling the positive space. And I wanted to fill that positive space and bring all of these different layers, a more elevated Ireland to the American um persona to, to American household, if you like. And so that was the beginning of it in 2001, 2002. And it start, started with a shortbread cookie. And here I am today. <laughs> well, well, there you go. There you go. Mm -hmm. So you talk about wine. You talk I about talk everything. I, listen, I say to my husband, I would talk to a chair, would talk back to my husband says, you talk if nobody talked back to you. <laughs> <laughs> So let's, let's jump in with some little unexpected things. So um, it, with my business, it's basically an Irish lifestyle brand and hence the name Rachel Gaffney's Real Ireland. Um, and I do it through different avenues, food and drink, cooking classes, travel. I have a big travel side of my business. I arrange trips for people to Ireland every year. Um, but I spend a lot of time doing my own research. When I say that, I've been doing this for 20 years. I would go to Ireland on my own hire a car with no plan for two or three weeks and drive and drive and drive and stop and drive and take notes and document 
oh, when I'm talking to Karen, you know, oh, I know where you need to go and what you need to know. So I'm really a glorified storyteller. So this is a good family friend, but he's only passed away two months ago and I'm really sad, but this is a book. I don't know if you can see this. Let's it's put you on, oh, hold on, let me put you here. Oh yeah, don't worry about me, just do the book. So it's called A Kingdom of Wine by Dr. Ted Murphy. This was the best book ever written um, in English or any language actually, and was awarded the Gourmand Award. Um, and it was the best book in the world for wine history for 2006. And it's the story of the Irish and the wine. And I don't mean the Irish drinking wine. I mean the Irish vineyards and the very, very famous houses that are named after Irish families and Irish people that emigrated. So right before you continue, I'm, I'm fascinated because I used to live in Napa. And when yep. I think wine, I think Napa, I think Italy. Ireland is not the first thing that I go to when I think about wine. And so we have to change that perception, right? Right, but it's not about um, us growing wine or viticulture in Ireland. It's Irishmen uh, and women taking their skills in agriculture, farming, viticulture, and, and moving and emigrating and settling down and starting these great famous brands that nobody associates with an Irish person. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, and I even wrote the date down because I don't want to get the dates wrong, but this is important to me to get the date right. So Richard Hennessy was born in 1720 in Cork, which is where I'm from, okay, in a place called Killavollen. Um, he went to France and he worked, uh, he was an officer in Dillon's regiment. He fought at the Battle of, the Battle of Fonteray, and then in 17, uh, that's in 1745. Then in 1765, he settled in Cognac and he had, he was married and he had a son and years later, his son and he went into business together and um, it is known, I think it's the, the largest brandy producer in the world. So that's Hennessy Cognac brandy. Wow. But people don't realize, you know, so here you have Richard Hennessy who emigrated from Ireland, fought in, in, in wars and started in this, in this business. And so there are several, there are hundreds actually of them in famous houses in uh, Bordeaux, in um, Australia, in Chile and whatever. So I'll give you examples of names of some famous families in France. So you have Kerwin, Lynch, Galway, as in G-A-L-W-E-Y, which is also another wine, McCarthy, Hennessy, McMahon, Dillon, Lawton, Barton, Phelan. So there's all these drinks named after it. I mean, you have, um, in, in um, California, you have, have you heard of Limerick Lane? Yes, I have. Okay, so Limerick Lane um, Cellars, you know, is in California. And, and that's another Irish family that emigrated and settled and started this vineyard. So I'm talking about, so what Ted did was he did the research for 50 or 60 years and, and he wrote this book, which is the most comprehensive book you'll ever find. It's, it's a history book. Um, and then he was awarded um, his honorary doctorate, Dr. Ted Murphy, from the University College of Cork. And they now have this course on viticulture and everything. Um, but what's really important, and this is for some other conversation and other things, when I arrange travel to Ireland for people, I go very, very deeply into um, revealing these layers. So, for example, Cork is a very, very historical city from the point of view that the port is famous for its export. So it would have exported crystal, cork crystal to the White House under President Washington. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so there, you know, there was a, a huge connection between the port of Cork and Bordeaux. I'm going back hundreds of years. So there are reasons why these happened. Um, and there are so many stories like that. So when somebody's going to Ireland, they might want to know where they're going, maybe what kind of things they can do and experience and learn about. Or more importantly, is when they are going and they don't know any of this, it's up to me to pick up on the clues when they're talking to me. Because you guys, look, if I was to do your trip, people do this all the time. They drop clues. They don't realize they're dropping breadcrumbs. And I'm trying to pick up on, I don't know, it could be the way somebody's dressing or they're talking about how they eat, where they live, where they went to college or school. Mm -hmm. There's just things that I might find and go, you know where you need to go? You know, something that might resonate with somebody. And I think that's what makes your trip uh, much richer. How has the past year and a half impacted and are you back up planning? Are you traveling? Are you taking people? To, are you are people ready now to, to hit the road? 
um, they are ready to hit the road. Um, there's a thing in the travel industry at the moment. I just wrote about wrote about it last month. Actually, I write for Georgina Campbell, which is Ireland's leading independent hospitality guide. It's been around for a long time, and I just wrote an article called Revenge Travel, and it is actually called Revenge Travel, where people are ready to, as you say, hit the road. They want to go. Right. The problem being, and the messaging is a little confusing from Europe. So you have, as us here in the US, we know that people are going to Florida, they're going to Wyoming, they're going to their, you know, their second homes in the, you know, in Tahoe or in Colorado, uh, Mexico's off the charts, um, Greece, Turkey, Croatia, places like that. But Europe, of course, people hear Europe is opening up and they think, oh, Europe's open, we'll go. Yeah, but Europe, there are so many different countries within Europe, right? And, you know, Ireland is in Europe, but it's not in the Schengen zone. And this is where it starts to get complicated. Each right. country in Europe then has its own rules. So the messaging is a little bit mixed. Now, Ireland literally just has started opening up in the last two weeks for their own people. Not Forget international ah. numbers. I mean, my own parents were locked up. You know, they had lockdown for months. They couldn't go two and a half miles beyond their house. Mm. Um, they're now slowly introducing outdoor dining. I mean... I'm saying this about my own people, I love it, but outdoor dining in Ireland, are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> you know, everything you've heard about our weather is true. That's that's not. That's but not there has to be frustrating. It has. To, I can only imagine how frustrating. And you like chomping at the bit because you wanna you wanna start back up again, and you you want to start taking these trips. I'm 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 sure you're getting emails and you're getting calls and you're getting when are when are you going when can we sign up right yes I am and I I'm doing things that are that are horrible that I have to do and tell them in my advice I'm actually saying to them and that's as of now this month you know this kind of we're into May June now I'm losing time of dates but I would tell them to hold on when I'm talking about Ireland I'm not talking about Italy or France. Mm -hmm. I, I, my business is Rachel Gaffney's Real Ireland. It's not Rachel Gaffney's Real Europe. And so I only specialize in Ireland and I only watch what's happening in Ireland. I would love to send them over there, but I'd rather not take their money. So I canceled everything obviously last year. And this year I've officially canceled everything for the rest of the year. Wow. wow. It's really hurt. But at the same time, I think for a trip to Ireland, I'm not saying that somebody might not call me and say, I need to see my aunt, I want to go see my mother, and I think I'll risk it in September, October. That's completely different. Right. I'm talking about somebody, you know, multi-generations, you know, right. grandparents and, and right. you know, you're planning around graduations and flights and you're upwards of $30,000, $40,000 for a trip. You don't need a quarter of an experience. You shouldn't, I don't want you paying full price for a quarter of the experience. Because um, the pubs won't be open. You know, you have to wear masks. You know, museums aren't open. Um, hairdressers are barely opened up yet. You know, got it. We um, need to give people a taste, though. Let's give people a taste of what they will be able to see yes. once they are in and able to go to Ireland. So, give me an idea. What are we? What are we looking at here? This was when I was in Dublin. I went out to Hoth. It's spelled H-O-W-T-H. You take the train from Dublin, and it was a 20 minutes, and I'm talking about a commuter train, and I just went out for the day just to be out by the water, and you can walk Hoth Head. And that was just sitting in, that's a working harbor where, so you can see all the trawlers are coming in, and the fish that comes in there is just incredible. And this is an, a beautiful suburb of Dublin. Um, you know, it's a well-to-do suburb, but it's a place that people don't go to enough. They go to Dublin, but they just do the city. Whereas if you're staying in the city center, hop on a train 20 minutes out there for the day, and all of the restaurants oh, wow. are And are. people don't know that, right? They don't know that, and that's why this is so important. We're, what are we looking at here? All right, so now we are in the Victorian part of the Victorian Wall Gardens at Kylemore Abbey. Uh, Kylemore Abbey's in Connemara, which is the very west of Ireland, you know, just north of Galway. Um, and Kylemore Abbey is run and operated by the Benedictine nuns. And these are part of their Victorian wall gardens. It's the number two visitor attraction in Ireland next to Guinness. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, I'm so, I love this. I, I love the water. I love, it looks, it's a castle. It looks like a castle. Tell us, what is this? This is one of my favorite places, girls. Um, I have, as they say in Ireland, I have a gra for this place. That means I have a love. Gra is the Irish word for love. So I have a gra for this place. I have a gra for the women in here. Um, the, the nuns run this abbey. And then you need to play a, a girls' boarding school. Wow. 
Um, it is no longer boarding school. It is now run and operated, still run and operated by them. And these women are the most incredible women. They make all their own chocolates, soaps. Uh, have you heard of Connemara ponies? Um, they've got wall gardens, Gothic cathedral. You can hike. You can. You could spend an entire day there, and you just won't have enough time. Wow. Uh, Right now they're building a monastery. Oh, this is uh, seaweed foraging. Um, I took all these people with me, uh, mostly from Texas, uh, some one or two from New Jersey. You can tell all the people who live in the southern states, wrapped up, look. <laughs> um, but we went on to this really wild part of the beach in Sligo to forage for seaweed. And I actually have this book here to show you. And this was written by- uh, they, can't see, wait, they can't see that right now. As soon as we come back off these pictures. Yeah. So the doctor that wrote the book is called An Irish Seaweed Kitchen. So everybody got a copy of the book before they went over. And we had to go foraging on the beach for the seaweed. But in those hampers are all of the salads. And we had a gazebo in the rocks. And everything they ate or drank was made from seaweed. And they were shocked and surprised. And then they had Connemara smoke, uh, peat smoked whiskey. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, there she is. There's probably oh, yeah. Look at that. Oh this woman here is a doctor. She's a medical doctor. And she's one of the world's leading authority on seaweed and what it does for your system and how good it is for you at fighting cancer and how many vitamins you get. And um, in Ireland, they cook with seaweed a lot. And we have a long history of seaweed, long before everybody knows about nori and, you know, um, going out for sushi and the Japanese. But, I mean, our grandmothers and great grandmothers and generations before were using seaweed. In actual fact, the chefs in Ireland have gone back to using all sorts of seaweeds to make stocks for their soups and dishes. Wow, wow! So this is uh, this uh, probably goes with the other shot that you had with the. No, nope. nope. this one is nope. actually the end of the country. This is in uh, down my neck of the woods, where I'm from in Cork. This is West Cork. Wow. Um, where I think one of our family members, I was on holidays just uh, with my cousin or something, and I was just out in the garden and I just took the picture outside. It's a cork, is a big sailing place as well. Oh, this is gorgeous. I was staying in Baltimore in West Cork and I took a ferry across to this little island. As you can see, that's the only thing on the little island, and I walked and went to the beaches. But these are the little unexpected pleasures that if you are constantly in a hurry you miss out on these little delights. That's why they need you. <laughs> this was one of the salads we had on the beach, the seaweed, do you see that? That's actually made with carrot and, you know, shelled, ca uh, shaped carrot, but then all sorts of wonderful things in there with different types of seaweeds and dressings. And in the background of that picture, that's a nori pesto. That's not pesto from, from basil or from basil. That's actually seaweed pesto. Wow. And it's that so delicious. Fine. So we cooked from this book. So it's called The Irish Seaweed Kitchen. And as I said to you, she is an MD. And I'm just going to show you. Um, and she lectures all over the world. You, you know, if people want a link, I'll share it. You could share it. But like, for example, here you've got some of these. Look at these beautiful recipes. Oh, wow. So carrageen moss is a type of seaweed. And it's used to make um, different types of puddings for its gelatinous qualities. And um, seaweed is used on the skin, and we do an awful lot of products in Ireland made with seaweed, and a lot of natural beauty products. You know, that's a very, very big scene in Ireland, our beauty products, skin care. And you offer a lot of these products through your website so that people can become acquainted or whether shopping or after they're there, they can continue to use what they've come to fall in love with. Yes. Um, what I do is I find things when I'm over there or things that I come across and I call them Rachel's favorite Irish finds. And I don't feature something because somebody says, here, you, uh, will, you, will you promote this for me? We'll pay you or, you know, you can be a, what do they call it, an influencer. I don't do any of that uh, because then they're not my finds. There's somebody else who finds exactly. it. So um, this was a woman that I met from County Carlo. Her name was Jo Brown, and I loved her story. And basically, she started off as an aromatherapist and made these kind of stick perfumes for traveling because she could never find them. So her brand grew, but everything she does is made with out of bamboo. Like the packaging is all bamboo. So this is one of her products, and I have one here, which is my own. It's nearly gone, but I'm going to show it to you. So this is her um, facial cleansing balm. Okay, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, the lid's on it, that's why. So this is her facial cleansing balm, and it's just a, 
you can see like this and you can rub it in your hands just to have it as a you know you can moisturize with it and it smells incredible and it's so clean even people with eczema can use this product that's how safe they are we're going to give them a way to purchase this and a way to to, to look at the, some of these products. We're going to put a link in the comments, so make sure you take a look at that. It'll also be, and we'll talk about that in a second, we have a kit that we've put together for the show. You'll be able to look at those products as well. I know you have a, a shampoo. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Love these. Shampoo soaps. So these are the nuns. Sister Genevieve makes these. And um, she is the, one of the nuns in Kylemore. They're building a monastery at the moment. Uh, While well, they're trying to build a monastery, um, I know that my bars of soap are not going to build it single-handedly, but it will definitely contribute. So they make them from everything from the garden. So this one is shampoo soap with seaweed extract, and this is rosemary. And you literally take the bar with you and wash your hair. But they're better for you than liquid soaps. Those are a big no-no. There's a whole story behind that, too. So I'm selling, I'm doing those because the money then goes back to them. So That's these were wonderful. things along the way. That's wonderful. We'll put a link. We'll put a link into the comments as well as I know they can go right over to your website because sure. you, you have all those things listed over there as well. You know, looking at the pictures and looking at the products you're showing us, uh, clearly I had some preconceived notions as to what mm -hmm. Ireland was. I, I mean, I think of you know, the luck of the Irish, I think of four leaf clovers, that that is about the extent of what I know about Ireland. This is, I, I think this is so important for our viewers to know that there there is something out there that they can go visit, they probably never would have thought about, right? I mean, this is just... Well, would you have thought of uh, surfing? I mean, Sligo on the west coast of Ireland hosts some of the best surfing championships in the world because of their beaches. And our food is, in my opinion, Ireland is the greatest chef's pantry in the world. Um, our ingredients are probably, they're up there, just Italy, France, and, and Ireland. Our ingredients are world-class, and it's not what you think it is. So well, and I love what we said earlier about, you kind of said, oh, I don't know, what the, whatever they're called, influencers. You actually, you're a tremendous influencer, Rachel, because you are teaching and showing and peeling back the layers of, of preconceived notions. And, and we have too many of those in our world, whether it's with, again, you know, societal mm -hmm. or aging, everything. Mm -hmm. And you're showing, and, and it's more dear to your heart because it's your home. Right. And what you're showing the products, you know, I'm, I think of Ireland, I, I come from a family of golfers and it's golf and whiskey. Yes. And there's, yes. and it's a beautiful country and there's so much more there. And Mel, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, with, as you said, that there's the golf and the whiskey. Yeah, there's those sides of it. There are those sides of it, too. And I do cover all of that. But, but that's me, not it. Yeah. Not but it's actually when I'm on Instagram or something, I just want to introduce you to more unexpected people, places and products. And it's my way of shouting out for the people who are doing great work. And um, not because somebody's paying me to do it, but I'm just doing it. Yeah. My husband jokes and says, you love working for free. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think we all love that. working for free. We, we all love working. So, yeah. Yeah. Food. so what what kind of food? What kind oh, of food? Oh my gosh. Okay. Give us some examples. All right, so first of all, when you go to Ireland, you've got to order fish. Off the charts, the fish is the best. Irish people are not the greatest at eating fish, even though we're surrounded by it, but they're getting better, but we love fish. Um, all of our cattle, and, I mean, I love, I love lamb in Ireland. I will not eat lamb when I come back here because it's so good. Salmon in Ireland, is, I know I just said fish, but salmon is incredible. And I like to go fly fishing. I know you probably don't think that about me, but I love fly fishing, <laughs> which is another thing. I like to take women with me actually on culinary tours to go fly fishing, catch the fish. And then, and then we eat it. And then you cook it. Oh, I love that. I love that. Another thing too is um, baked goods. But what we're really good at, um, with tons and tons of orchards and, you know, blackberries grows at the side of the road. Foraging is a very big part of Irish life. I'm talking about wild garlic, mushrooms, rowan trees, uh, elderflowers, making elderflower drinks and wines. And, you know, all of these things, our portions are smaller and our food is cleaner. Um, and I mean by clean is, you know, salad isn't laden with some heavy dressing. Right. You know, our foods are uh, small portions. Um, our breads are incredible. Um, if we could, and we have the ingredients we do. <laughs> I'm getting hungry right now. I think we need to have, we, we need to do a live Here's show <laughs> when travel opens back up. We need to go with you and experience this ourselves and have the camera there and, and, and be there live 
and really oh, that'd be so fun i could i'd love to see the two of you trying to forage for seaweed <laughs> <laughs> i would love to see that too so would my husband i don't think he would believe <laughs> oh, well, how how the, very surprised. the other the other thing too um oysters um, I've taken people with me. Um, so the, the oysters on the east coast of Ireland are different to the oysters on the west coast. And um, I took them to Carlingford, which is on the east coast. It's north of Dublin. And we went to Carlingford Oysters. And they had to go out in their welly boots. And they literally had to walk out with the guys and learn how to, you know, harvest the oysters. But then they learned why they taste different and why they taste so good and so pure. And it's because of the waters that come down off the mountains across the different limestone rocks, across the different types of heathers and wildflowers. And then by the time they come into the lock and they're filtered, you know how oysters are, they filter, you're, you're absorbing all of these flavors from what the water carried. And then if you go across to Galway, they have their own oysters. In fact, Galway has one of the biggest oyster festivals every year. It's great fun. Um, and their oysters are delicious, but taste different. And it's different types of waters and vegetation. You know, and, and mussels. I love mussels in Ireland. They're just mm, scrumptious. You're you all are I'm starving. <laughs> I, I love oysters. I love oysters. So I'm really, really hungry. You, you are a monthly columnist for the Georgina uh, Campbell's Ireland Guide, yes. um, Ireland's leading independent food, and we're going to put a link to that there. What kind mm -hmm. of things can people expect to read about on your in your monthly column? Oh, I write a letter. I write a column. It's called Rachel Gaffney's Letter from Texas. And oh. basically my musings and stuff. So last month was revenge travel and what I thought was happening. Um, I wrote one time about the food truck scene in, in Austin years ago, sort of letting people over there know things. And things that I see that are happening or places I've been, you know, that, that, that uh, in Ireland that I'm talking about or experiences. Because I've done a lot of uh, podcasts and interviews with people over the last year during the pandemic. I've traveled to an awful lot of castles around Ireland virtually this year oh. um, to keep myself informed. So I have this, I have a lot of quivers, um, a lot of arrows, sorry, in my quiver um, right now. So I've got to, I'm just trying to keep myself up to date constantly with what's happening over there because right. the private country house and the exclusive rentals are really a great way to go when you're over there. You can split it between a couple of families, you know, um, and I do use castles as well. I love that. I love that. You know, Mel and I were talking before uh, a couple of days ago about um, travel just in general and yeah. how how life has changed. Um, yes. And as things are starting to open up, where are we going to go first or second or third? I know that Mel had a trip planned originally and it's now been postponed to a later date. She was going to go back to Sicily, right? In Italy. Uh, with, yeah. You know, uh, to eat to eat her way through. I think you were going to cook and do, drink. Um, you know, me personally, in terms of travel, I I love to cruise. So so I can't wait to get on a cruise ship, and I'm hoping there's some way to go to Ireland and maybe get there and then go see. I'm not a big flyer, but I I, I would love to come visit come visit and come with you and go see it. So you're hearing it first here, guys. I might actually get on an airplane. I don't know. I, I will get you there. I okay, you can, actually, you can take a cruise ship into Ireland and you can get off there. Okay. Uh, you can do that. But also, it's I, again, I want to make it clear that I don't want to deter or stop people from going to Ireland this year. It's just that I just don't feel it's quite ready. So I would love if people would start planning for the spring and the summer of 2022 for a really great experience. That's you know? yeah. we're planning for Europe. I'm, we're traveling yeah. locally and within the continental United States. And I was in Mexico last weekend and I felt safe. And right. where did you go? Um, Punta Mita. Oh, it's nice. North of Puerto Vallarta. It was, it was incredible. And yeah. the, the people there are excited and welcoming to have, you know, visitors again and life. And it was busy and vibrant. And, and you know, for all of us, it feels good. Well, we're breaking out. We're breaking out of our, our cocoon of being in our, I mean, I've been in my house as we all have. Uh, I literally did not leave my house for almost a year and a half. Um, and that's because I have a husband who has immune issues and things, and I just were too scared to go out. And now that we are vaccinated, every time I go out, I literally think, oh my goodness, there are people here. You know, there's like lots of people here. <laughs> so I can't wait. I 
personally cannot I, wait. I heard on the news yesterday that the sales of lipstick are going through the roof. <laughs> yeah, that was the first casualty. You know, yeah. And we have to wear pants now. We have to actually wear pants. <laughs> yes. Please don't give me that oh, vision. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> You know, um, I want to let, I want to make sure that people know how to get in touch with you. Um, you are, have a, a great presence on Instagram, and they can find you there by going to Rachel G. Uh, J Rachel Gaffney. You mm -hmm. also have a presence on YouTube, and yes. so all they have to do is search for you, Rachel A. Gaffney, and they can go see the videos that you've created. That's lots of fun, and they can also go, as where, I said, where sorry, where is it coming up, Rachel A. Gaffney? I, hey, I copied and pasted my friend. That's oh, what you gave okay. me. So okay. I, that actually is goes to your 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 page because I went and looked. So it does. Okay. <laughs> See, you learn something every day. Um, so you want to check that at, at, at as well. Um, any any last thoughts that you want to share with us about this whole, you know, real Ireland that we need to know? I think it's it just the, what we talked about, the, the unexpected. <laughs> Um, it's kind of disconcerting because the voice is coming back at me. There we go. Um, very much the um, the unexpected and everything you think you know, you don't really. Um, mm -hmm. Give it a try. And I don't want you to go there because your granny's from Ireland or you need to see before you die. I mean, if you want to go there for those reasons, Ireland, Irish people will be thrilled to welcome you. But I want you to go, especially if you love adventure and the outdoors. You know, my God, there's so much to do. I mean, I love going paddle boarding and kayaking and cliff diving and all that sort of stuff. And so there's plenty of all that. Um, and it's it's just it, it's just well worth the visit. So um, if you want to go, just let me know. I think it's great. I think as we come out of our cocoon, as I said, it's really exciting to hear about things like this that I never would have thought about. I, I honestly never would have thought about this. And I will tell you this. I will leave you with this. When Americans do go over to Ireland, Irish people are going to be, I mean, they're not only going to be opening their arms, they're going to be hanging out, almost pulling you off oh the plane. My. Because, you know, Ireland and America, you know, our connections are so tight. Um, they miss, I know we miss each other very much. I can imagine. Mel, any last minute thoughts? I just want to thank you for, for coming on today and for your time and for sharing and exposing and, you know, to all the pleasures and the unexpected pleasures of Ireland. And I hope everyone checks out Rachel's website and we're all ready to start traveling when we can and, and we're gonna come your way. Thank you so much, ladies. And make sure you check for the links that are in the in the uh, comment section below. We want to thank our viewers. You have a choice as to where you spend your time. You chose to spend it with us today. We are eternally grateful. Go out and give somebody an awesome day, and we'll see you next time on Uncorked. See you later, everyone. Ciao.